Hello there, you're watching the John Cedars channel from the bunker and as you will know, I like to interview those who, like myself, are former Jehovah's Witnesses to get their perspective on what life is like exiting the organization. One thing I'm particular in, particularly interested in is exploring the stories of those who have had to battle through sexual repression, particularly those who have exited because they are gay and because homosexuality is stigmatized within the organization. And here to tell his story uh, is along those lines is Jeremy, who runs the channel Mentally Diseased. Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So your channel is just superb. Um, it's started up fairly recently. Um, I'm I'm guessing that that you kind of felt an an impulse to launch yourself into activism, which you've clearly done in a big way, and we'll get to all the reasons for that. But I'm most interested to know more about your story and your background. Um, where how did you get to this place? Yeah, well, I mean, how far back you want to go? All the way to the beginning, or <laughs> in the beginning? In the beginning. Um, <laughs> so I guess from you know, were you born into the organization? Yeah, yeah. I would. I was born in. Um, both of my parents were. They had just converted when I, uh, right when I was born, probably within the same year. Um, so all of the doctrine was really fresh for them. Um, and my father in particular really, really bought into the whole Armageddon thing and the Satan and the demons thing. So uh, they weren't like, th I wasn't third generation or anything like that, but they, they were pretty gung-ho. Um, so yeah, uh, we moved around a lot and lived in a lot of isolated places. So I had a pretty isolated upbringing. Um, and let's see, I'm trying to f figure out where, where, to, where to get into it here. Uh, so presumably the, the isolated upbringing meant that the family was fairly, you know, tight knit. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, we were, we were very tight knit and pretty cut off when they converted, they, they cut off most of their own family. Um, right. So you know, family was never really a big thing to me just because we didn't interact with our family at all, which is... Were, were they kind of viewed as bad association or something? Yeah, and and honestly, they were bad association, especially, especially on my father's side. There were a lot of uh, criminals, jailbirds, you know, people, people in prison for anything that you can think of, kidnapping, you know, everything. Oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that they were, they converted That's perhaps over. Perhaps for another episode, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were really trying to, I think, fix their lives. Mm. Um, so, and in the same way, I felt like I had a lot to prove um, because I had, I came from this family full of just awful people. And, you know, I wanted to be the one that made it. You know, a lot of kids always want to be. A lot of kids from poorer families want to be the one that goes to college or something like that. I wanted to be that same. It was the same thing for me, but it was more like go to Bethel or, you know, become a circuit overseer or something, something along those lines. So I was very into it from a very young age. And were you into it because you genuinely believed it or to make your parents happy or maybe a bit of both? Uh, it was, it was a bit of both. It was, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that I ever didn't believe it until my mid-teens. I mean, from the the first 10 years of my life, I really was a model witness, and I believed everything that I heard. Sure. And if, if are there any kind of stories, because I, I tell a few stories in my book that kind of just give an, an insight into what life is like as a as a child growing up in that religion, because... I would imagine that there's lots of viewers who've never been witnesses who, who, for whom the whole thing is just alien, but they certainly couldn't imagine going through a witness childhood. Can you think of any, any occasions during your childhood that really kind of, you know, showed or highlighted the situation you were in? Yeah, um, a lot of it was probably, I mean, it probably just had to do with the spiritism. Like you saw, at least my family did, they 
there were demons everywhere and in everything and everything that went wrong was blamed on the demons. Um, so for instance, um, anytime, but my, my father was really prone to rage and he'd get into fights all the time, uh, with my mom. And anytime that happened, you know, after he calmed down, he'd raid our bedrooms looking for something that we, that we had that brought Satan into the house. And so, you know, uh, it was a also, pretty... if there was an argument or some kind of confrontation, he'd assume that it was your fault for bringing something that you shouldn't have brought into the house. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. It was, ne it was never him taking responsibility for anything. Right. So it was, there was a regular seizure of our personal things and tossed away. I remember pogs were blamed. If anyone remembers pogs, you know, <laughs> um, you know, books that I had all sorts of stuff. So, and then at the same time, like when you're constantly being told this and constantly being rated at such a young age, you really start to believe it. So I had a lot of, now I understand them as kind of delusional experiences where I thought that I saw like, you know, demons in my bedroom. I'd wake up in the middle of the night. I really think that it was sleep paralysis at this point, but at the time I just, mm. I believed demons were there. It was a part of regular everyday life. Yeah. They're there and, and they prefer to visit you when you're prone to hallucination and semi-conscious and <laughs> unable yeah. to verify their presence. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So at what point did you find yourself drifting from the faith? Uh, it was probably mid-teens. Well, I mean, so once I hit puberty, I started to realize that I was gay and that was a uh, that was a huge thing. But for me, it wasn't necessarily what drove me away. It was just, it was a major problem um, because it, it just put a damper into everything. I was trying to get baptized and I didn't feel comfortable getting baptized, having this problem with me. So I started to do a lot of, you know, self torment. I kept like a safety pin in my pocket and I would jab myself in the thigh anytime that I had an errant thought. Um, you know, you jab yourself with a safety pin every time you had a, a, yes. a homosexual inclination. Yeah, let me tell you, at 13, that's a lot of jabs. Oh. <laughs> you know, grief. just anything that I could do to associate it with negative thoughts. Because so basically self-flagellation, we're, we're talking about at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd even gotten online and looked up gay conversion therapy to see if there was any any anything that I could do from home. The safety pin was the best thing I could come up with. So uh, it was several years of tormenting myself like that and just trying to, because they, they make you feel like, it's almost like you, you feel like you're a pedophile. Like it's, it's just so disgusting. You have this horrible sexual perversion. You're just, you know, so I went on like that until probably 15, 16 or so. And I realized there's nothing I can do to change this. There's no amount of praying I, I can do. It's never going to go away and I'm just making it worse. So that was a big part of it. Um, there were, and there were a lot of other things like we did, we moved around a lot, which meant moving from congregation to congregation to congregation. I was also homeschooled. Um, so with the way the witnesses are, you can only associate with other witnesses and you're constantly moving and never really, settling in one place long enough to attach to a congregation. It was very isolating. Um, but one of the things that was highlighted in all of, all of those moves is how different the culture is from congregation to congregation. That really opened my eyes. Just, you know, in one congregation, it's totally fine to do one thing. The next congregation, you're getting sat down with the elders. Um, so that, that was a major contributing point for me. And at one point we had a sit down with the elders and this was partially because my dad, he was being very abusive and we were talking to him about, to them about that. And they were very just unsympathetic. It was are just you, are very... you still close to your dad, by the way. No, not no. at all. Um, and that's not necessarily to do with the religious, any religious divide. It's just, no. Yeah. He, right. he, he calls from time to time. I, I hardly answer. It's just not a healthy, no, thing for me i think you yeah. need to set boundaries for yourself and that's a boundary i set yeah you need to keep toxic people out of your life don't you yeah so, so you have this kind of um sit down with the elders 
Yeah. So we, we sat down with him because he was abuse, being very abusive toward me, my mom as well. Um, and, you know, they they basically just, you know, it's, he's the head of the house. It's maybe you shouldn't be, uh, it, it was always somehow my fault. I was aggravating him. I was provoking him in some way. I wasn't sitting down and shutting up when I needed to be. And they said kind of the same things to my mom, you know, it's, uh, they brought up that scripture. I can't remember the wording right now. It was something like there's, uh, what is it? Nothing, nothing more annoying to a man than a wailing wife or something like that. Something oh, like right. that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, um, and in the same meeting, I brought up a lot of questions that I had about the doctrine that didn't quite make sense to me. Cause I, I remember I was, uh, kind of self teaching myself about environmentalism. And I was like, how is, you, you say in paradise that everyone, basically everyone that's ever lived ever is going to be resurrected. How is the earth going to support all of these people? It just does not make sense to me. We're like getting to the point now where the earth can't support us. And, you know, it was... Didn't they kind of estimate in the reasoning book that everyone gets an acre. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was funny, yeah. <laughs> it, it just didn't make sense. And it, any kind of those questions, it was just regarded as apostasy, really. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, at that point, I just started to view, I, st I still believe the core doctrine, but I started to view the organization itself as flawed and flawed and corrupt. Sure. So w what fascinates me is <clears throat> that it's hard enough wrestling with, you know, um, with a crisis of conscience when you, when you first start waking up and, it's hard enough dealing with this, with sexual repression as a straight person. You know, I, I can only marry someone within my faith. Um, I'm not allowed to masturbate. All of these things create like a, like a whirl of, uh, of guilt in a straight person. So I can only imagine how tormenting it must be to be a, a, a Jehovah's Witness who knows they are gay and who knows that this is something that could result in their destruction if Armageddon were to come, but to still believe the doctrine. So talk us through where your head was at when you were in that state. Oh, it was, it, it was absolutely miserable. Like you're just, you feel guilty about everything. And I mean, you, you do learn how to be a good actor. I'll, I'll say that because mm -hmm half of it is just trying to disguise mannerisms that naturally come out. Um, you, you never want to be, every witness seems to have a story of like, though there was a brother in the congregation, he was so gay. Well, everyone knew he was gay. And you know, you did not want to be that guy. You, you did not. So um, it, it's just every aspect of your life. You, you really learn to, to con just control. Like I can, I'm going to sit up straight and back straight. I'm not going to look at, this brother, that brother, I'm going to keep my eyes straight ahead. And it's just, uh, I just, it, it's really difficult to, to articulate, but it's just constant guilt, constant anxiety. And really it follows you for years and years afterwards. Were you in any situations where you were attracted to a, another brother in the congregation and that caused problems? Um, I mean, I was definitely attracted to a lot of people, mm. um, but I, I was pretty good about keeping it, pe keeping it clamped down. I think that there mm. was only one close friend that I had that I had a big crush on, but I was, so he was also very homophobic. So, mm. you know, <laughs> there, there was nothing that was going to happen there. So I don't think that- He was homophobic, he was homophobic but he didn't have a very good gaydar by the sounds of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he did actually, I had a couple of friends that actually knew uh, knew about me that right that were in the congregation. I had a well, he was one of them, um, and another person was I, I tried dating a girl, and you know, we we call this a beard, just something to try to try to fix myself and keep everyone else from asking questions. So they both kind of took it upon themselves to fix me. So uh, okay. So that, that was kind of the situation. They were, they were both good to me and quiet about it until, mm. uh, until it officially came out and then they completely churned on me, mm. pretended like they never knew. And then I, I haven't 
talked to either of them since. Um, yeah, because I, I guess going back to how I perceive things as a believing JW, uh, I was I was homophobic. I, you know, you have to be as a Jehovah's Witness. You have to think of gay people as something slightly less. You know, there's something wrong with you. Um, so I can remember having that inclination, and I can also remember seeing people or encountering uh, witness men who looked to me to be gay just purely through the way they talked or, or comported themselves. And I would be thinking, well, probably, probably he is gay, but as long as he, you know, doesn't act on it, he's still my brother and I still have to, you know, uh, love him and respect him. So I guess that was my way of, of dealing with it. But how, how is someone supposed to limit themselves in that way for the rest of their lives and lead a happy, fulfilled life for the rest of, of eternity, you know? Yeah, it's it, it's a terrible thing to expect of some expect anyone to do, um, mm -hmm. and a very just kind of unempathetic and selfish way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, just oh, just so as long as you don't act on who you are, I guess I guess it's okay, and and it just creates so many problems in the future. These people that like say hypothetically, if I had never been caught and I'd stayed in and just tried to fix it, I would have ended up marrying somebody probably having a bunch of kids and maybe in my fifties or something realize I've wasted my whole life. Mm. And, you know, uh, the, and this happens to a lot of gay people, even outside of the religion, they end up finally accepting who they are in the mid middle age crisis and just wrecking a family, wrecking mm. a family because they, and you, how can you blame them for that? You know, yeah. just, uh, but it's, you end up with kids that lose their fathers, wives that lose their husbands. It's just, yeah, which is which is why I think that sexual repression is something that doesn't get nearly enough attention, and I try to address it to some extent in my book because I, I really do think it messes with people in very far-reaching ways. Um, so you go through this, and and something something else it sounds like was a catalyst for you waking up from your indoctrination. Yeah. Um... Well, uh, I guess I haven't really talked about talked yet about how I actually ended up coming out. Um, right. So my family was kind of in a weird situation where we were moving once again, um, but I was turning 18. And so my parents had moved into a new smaller place that didn't have room for me. And I was going to move in with some witnesses. Uh, they, they had like a trailer on their land. I was going to move into the trailer. So I was waiting for that to get ready. There was a limbo area where I was still in our old house living all by myself. And, you know, I was pretty frustrated with the religion at the time. And so I was like, well, I'm alone right now. This is, I'm about to live right next door to some witnesses. So this is probably the only chance for freedom I'm ever going to get. So I met somebody online and decided to just see what it's like. I'm going to try this out, try out dating somebody. And uh, he drove, he drove out to visit me at the house. And I think it was actually the weekend of a circuit assembly. And I, I told my parents that I had to work that weekend and I was gonna to go to the next circuit assembly the following weekend. And my mom's so nosy. She knew that I was up to something and she, <laughs> so I guess she left the circuit assembly early to come and make verify that I was at work. Oh, good grief. And found I wasn't, came home and I, I was with somebody and you know, that, that's when it all came out. Um, and this was literally the first time I'd met the person. I didn't know anything about him. Right. Um, you know, and so that's kind of how it all went. She ran and told the elders and, uh, but what a stressful situation to be in. That must've been terrifying for you to oh have your mom, your mom come back like that. Oh, it felt like the end of the world, man. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah hear that car pull up outside the heart. I tried stuffing him under the bed. This is like a <laughs> six foot two cop. I tried shoving him under the bed. Like she's not going to. Sounds like trying to get rid of a body, doesn't it? Oh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Word. That's what it was like. Wow. So, so yeah. And it all just, it happened so quickly from that point. And she disappeared and I'm just trying to figure out what I'm going to do, how I'm going to get out of this. And then I get a phone call from the elders and they want to meet with me. And, um, 
And I knew what the phone call, I knew what they wanted to meet with me for. I knew what was going to happen and I wasn't going to do it because I wasn't, I wasn't baptized either. So I just like, I'm not obligated to do this. They can't make me go to some meeting. Um, but, uh, so, so they basically did it over the phone and they asked me to stop being gay. Are you going to stop being gay? It's fine. As long as you don't act on it. And I said, no, like you don't understand. I think I, at that point I was convinced that the witnesses were wrong about gay people and do you think that their aim was to simply reprove you so that you didn't get disfellowshipped? I maybe I I don't know. I think that they mm. I felt like they were going to kick me out. Um, right. It, it was very confusing because I I still don't really understand if I'm am I disfellowship like I was never baptized. I don't I don't know. I guess I'm. What you were never baptized. For? No, I was never baptized. Oh, well, in that case, they, they can't haul you in front of a judicial committee then. Did they give you a judicial committee? They, they were trying to pull me into one. Well, they can't because you're not baptized. I don't, I don't know what they were doing. Good grief, <laughs> that is strange. Yeah, I, but everything about my situation, everything about the way that they handled my case was very not typical for for the situation because I was completely shunned. My parents were instructed. They, after they had the phone call with me, they called my parents and they said, well, he's not going to do this. And they, the way we see it, you have no reason to talk to him anymore. So it was, I was treated as completely disfellowshipped. Um, Even though you'd never been baptized and hence technically were not a Jehovah's witness. Exactly. Yeah. So, Mm it my which i was not expecting either part of why i was standing so firm was like i had it in my head i knew i wasn't baptized i knew that Mm. there was nothing they could really do to me like well they can do whatever i'll probably my parents will probably kick me out i guess i'm not gonna be able to live with these witnesses but at least i'll still have my my friends my my friends don't have to shun me i was never baptized it's fine Mm. and then my mom came over with a bundle of letters from all of my friends and they they all ended their friendships with me I had nowhere to live and that was they my parents were saying we we don't want to talk to you until you come back to Jehovah. So that, that I don't was, think I've ever heard a story like that of someone going through the whole disfellowshipping thing and whole shunning thing even though they've not been baptized. I can think of situations in my own life where because someone uh, like a relative for example just happens to not be baptized they're doing all sorts of stuff that would get them disfellowshipped, but because they're not baptized, they still enjoy regular association um, with the JW relatives that I have. So that, it's astonishing that they still treated you like that, even though you hadn't actually committed to the religion. Yeah, it, it was very shocking. And, and to be honest, since I, I've talked about my story on, on my channel before, and since I put that out there, I've had a lot of other people come out, uh, reach out to me that had almost the exact same experience. They say, oh my God, I had the, I didn't get baptized for the same reasons you didn't. I was still shunned, disfel- act treated as disfellowshipped. And I, I think it's just that they approach gay people and, and hold them in a different sort of uh, state. Yeah, know? yeah. Because there's already the, the phenomenon where outside of the religion where if you come out to your parents you risk yeah probably yeah. if you've been straight and it had been a, a girl whose body you were trying to hide under the bed <laughs> probably it would have played out very differently because you know they would have viewed you as salvageable you know but yes. because because you're you're gay they were may, they were maybe thinking well even if he does you know, he, he's not going to be in our religion anyway. He, he's always going to be a lost cause. So maybe that was driving their thinking a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And like I said earlier, they kind of view it in the same way that, at least at the time, they viewed it in the same way as pedophilia, which mm. is, you know, something what what can you do about? So just keep the congregation clean, get rid of them. Sure. So you are chucked out of the family. Um, you are severed from all of your friendships. What happens next? So, uh, man, I, w- I was floundering. I didn't have anywhere to go. I'd, I had like a little part-time job, but I didn't have any sa- savings, no money. I, I didn't know what to do with myself um, and no one to talk to. So I, uh, the 
person that had come over eventually contacted me to see how I was doing. And he offered to let me move in with him, um, which I was incredibly grateful for. Um, Cause it was the, it, it was, it was all I had. It was my only option. So I agreed to move in with this person that I do not know at all. I've met him once and it was just tragedy the one time I met him. So mm-hmm. he, and he lived in like a, on the other side of the state in the middle of nowhere in, in, in the mountains. And I go out there, it's just me and my cat basically. And Oh, that I think that that following year is probably the darkest year of my life because, you know, I didn't, I, I go into the middle of the mountains, not, no one to talk to. There was no internet at this place. Um, I couldn't find a job. I, and he was a cop. He was gone a lot. Um, sometimes he was gone for days at a time. And it was just me sitting alone in a room with nothing to do, but just, mull about my lot in life and wonder wonder what the hell I'm going to do. I'm at I'm at this person's mercy and he once I got there his colors changed quite a bit. He became very cold, um very just just not a not a great person and I eventually found out um that when he was gone for days at a time, he was seeing, seeing other people. And it wasn't just seeing other people. He was going to see teenage boys, some of them as young as 12 or 13. Uh, right. And I just, I, at the time though, I didn't really even realize that I was, I basically walked into the den of, a, you know, a child sex abuser. I had, mm. he, I saw him as kind of like my savior. I was willing to give him a lot of, of leeway at, took me probably 10 years before I realized, Oh my God. Cause at that age, I just was like, he's cheating on me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? But uh, I got to a point there where I just felt so alone. So isolated. I found out that he's doing all of these things, still can't find a job, no one to talk to. Um, and I started going out. I raided neighbors mailboxes for those AOL free trial discs. I don't know if you remember those. Um, so I'd get those, bring them home and get online and like try and talk to somebody for the duration of the free trial. And he found out I was doing that and took the computer away and disappeared for several days. And I just got to a point where I, was, I felt like, I don't know, no matter what I'm going to do, I'm going to, no matter what I do, I'm going to die in Armageddon. And if I, I just started to feel like maybe I was, I'm just a mistake. I wasn't supposed to happen. And I, I just got to the point where I was going to end my own life. And it was very easy in that situation because he was a cop, there were firearms laying around the house. So there is, there was a whole day where I sat with one with a gun on the middle of the table and I'm just watching it. I'm contemplating and, I was really working up to do it. I was like, if he doesn't come home by the end of today, I'm going to do it. If I don't see another human being for the rest of this day, I'm going to do it. And it was that night that my mom called and said that she can't do this anymore. She's it's ridiculous that the elders are telling her that she can't talk to me. Wasn't even baptized. She's I'm going to get you home. You just hold on. I'm going to get you home. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to find a way. Uh, to do this without any of us getting in trouble. And she called you when you had a gun on the table. She, yes, yes. as insane. Absolutely saved my life. And just, just to kind of back, go back on this, just to summarize, you are in this situation because you have been severed from everyone that you care about through action that's been taken by the elders that is even more extreme than what Watchtower prescribes. And they have basically turned you into the arms of a pedophile through taking the action they've taken. It just makes me think how many, how many other stories are there like this where someone has been disfellowshipped, including those who are disfellowshipped having been baptized, who due to that action being taken, they end up being in a far, far more dangerous situation. Um, you could have very easily died in that situation. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure that a lot of people have. You know, it's mm. when when you're when you're in that 
organization for so long, I think a lot of witnesses are kind of in an infantile state, especially when they get kicked out and they're very vulnerable. They don't, they really don't understand how the world works. And when you're, um, I've been trying to think of a way to articulate this, but in, when you're in that religion, you have no boundaries with anyone that's in the religion. It's always, yes, yes, whatever you want. You let the elders come into your house whenever you, whenever they want to come over, you do whatever they tell them to, whatever they tell you to do. So when you leave, you take that same mindset. Okay, so the witnesses are no longer my people. Now the worldly people are my people. And you take that same lack of boundaries into the world. And, you know, there are people out there that can recognize a vulnerable person and they will find you. And you won't, you know, so many people aren't equipped to identify that or to deal with it. Hmm. So your mother, in, in incredible timing, manages to rediscover her humanity. Um, how did things change from that point forward? Uh, they, were, they were still really rough um, because I did have to start over, really. The, the arrangement that my parents had was they, they rented out an office for their business um, that had a room in the back. So I moved into the room in the back of this office. It was a terrible situation. I didn't have a bathroom there. There was like a public bathroom shared with the offices there. So when all the buildings, when all the businesses shut down, I had to like sponge bath in a public bathroom. Uh, <laughs> it, it was it was really, really awful. But they, they did it that way so that they could tell the elders when they asked, well, he's, it's a business relationship. He's just working for the business and we are preaching preaching to him. So... Uh, but it did give me a start. It at least gave me money so I could start saving and eventually find another job that was unrelated to this, find my own place. It took so many years to get to get on my own two feet and to start building a new social network for myself. Um, so that that's kind of how it went. Um, but I still, this whole time, I was still waiting and waiting and waiting for the Watchtower to get new light about gay people because I really wanted to come back. I really missed my friends. So you were still indoctrinated through all of this experience? All of it. I, I felt like I deserved all of it, that I was, you know, it was my fault. Um, and it, it kept going on like that until my mom eventually woke up. She, she heard about the child sex abuse cases and that was just too much for her because she had been abused um, and it, she just couldn't stand behind it. So she ended up leaving and she ended up, you know, finding out about the United Nations and all of that and really woke, woke me up. And even then, <laughs> um, I, was still, I was still just so on the fence about it. I don't think it was until I saw the, the special that you did with Leah. Um, oh, really? Yeah, that was really what got me going here. Um, wow. Because I was watching that special and there were all of those stories about, about the suicides. And that really just woke something up in me because I... I'd always felt really alone in my experience. I felt like, A, I deserved it. And, you know, I don't know where I was going with that, but I, I felt like I deserved it and it was just me and it was an isolated case. And when I saw all these stories about people that had taken their own lives over what the Watchtower had done to them, I, I just re realized that how therapeutic it could be just to hear other people's experiences that are similar to your own um and, and that's really that's really why i started to get active now just to tell my story and to reach out to people that may feel the way that i did um and well, tell well, them that you you're really not hit the ground running because <laughs> <laughs> again your, your channel is just superb and uh, the content that you're putting out is just brilliant and uh the fact that that all of this has been prompted so recently um, it's just astonishing. Um, and I'm just glad that, you know, the, the, the aftermath special had that much of an impact so that we, you know, people like you are, are coming forward and telling your story. Yeah. Yeah. Then thank you very much. Um, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's an incredible thing to, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> it's liberating, isn't it? To, it, it express yourself because when when you are in the religion you don't have a voice do you your opinion has to correspond with the, the opinion of the governing body 
Um, even when you are on the platform giving a public talk, you have your notes in front of you as to what you're supposed to say uh, as an elder. So there's never any any opportunity really to express individuality. So I think when you do become an activist, and activism isn't for everyone, I should just say that, but for those who can do it, um, it is a very cathartic experience, isn't it? Yeah, it very much is. And in in doing so, I've really unearthed a lot about myself that I hadn't realized before. Um, you know, when I was getting ready to tell my story and I'm going back through all of my, I used to keep a journal and going back through all my journal entries. And there's so many memories that I just completely blocked out. Um, so, and there's a lot about my own behavior now that I'm starting to understand just just in preparing, in preparing a topic to talk about. I'm like, oh my gosh, I do this and it's because of this. So, you know, it's, it's very helpful for myself as, as well as other people, I think. Sure. So I do have one more question and it is, if there's anyone watching this video who is inside the religion fighting with feelings that they've been told are forbidden, feelings that um, make them something less than human um, of a, you know, basically they're gay and they feel they're hating themselves and feeling guilt. Uh, what would be your message to them? Well, I think the number one most important thing is to understand that there's nothing wrong with you and you can't change it. Don't try to change it because the more that you try to change it, the more you're going to mess yourself up later in life um, in more ways than you'll be able to understand. I'm still dealing with a lot of, uh, you know, things that I'd done to myself mentally. And, you know, just really, I think, just keep quiet, just keep, just keep chugging along until make a very solid plan to get out. Make sure that you're safe. Don't do anything drastic. Um, but really you need to get out of there. <laughs> uh, but make sure first before you do anything that you have proper savings, you, you have a place to go, start building a social network outside of, you know, the watchtower. Um, but there, there's nothing wrong with you and it will get better. My life is so much better now than it was then. And, and what's very interesting is that uh, my life revolves around my sexuality way less now than it did when I was in Watchtower. You know, it's just a little part of you. When, once you get over this, it doesn't have to, your whole life doesn't have to be about you being gay. You know, you're a real full-fledged human being. Sure. I think that's an important point. It's, it's like that with sexual repression full stop. When, when something is being repressed, it kind of becomes a bigger deal than it ordinarily would be. So that once you're through that, once the repression's behind you, everything kind of settles into its proper place and you find it's not such a huge deal. Uh, but yeah, it does have a, a big impact on you. And I'm, I'm just grateful that that phone call came through when it did. And uh, so nice that you are in touch with your mother again. I know you guys did a video together um, and if anyone is watching this and isn't familiar with your channel, please head on over to Mentally Diseased, uh, subscribe, and you, you will really enjoy those videos. But Jeremy, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. So viewers, I hope you've enjoyed this interview. I certainly have. Please don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more videos. And as always, thank you for watching.